spine densities, and the spine density is a part of the nerve cell where one nerve cell will form this synaptic connection, and you can see that those have also shrunken up. So that suggests that if these treatments are turning on nerve growth factor, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, it could be very important. One of those is shown here, a molecule called BCL2, and this is showing that lithium is turning on BCL2. And BCL2 is a protein where if you genetically engineer mice to have more BCL2, they're protected against Alzheimer's, they're protected against stroke, they're protected against free radicals, and lithium was turning this on. So it made people wonder, is some of the ways these drugs are working, are they making these ner nerve cells more resilient so they, they can withstand the damage of the glutamate, of other things, et cetera? And there's a lot of new genetic studies suggesting that there might be something there. There's, again, some of these names have, you know, an alphabet soup, FKBP5. It's one of those molecules that seems to be associated with depression, with bipolar disorder. And again, coming back to what Dr. Hen said, this is an interesting study where it looked at people who had childhood abuse and what was the likelihood that they would develop post-traumatic stress disorder later. And genetic variations in FKBP5 seem to determine whether if you get this childhood abuse, do you or do you not develop post-traumatic stress disorder? It's an interesting thing that, you know, we all know that it's a gene-environment interaction. This suggests this might be one of those genes. So it's been tested in animals. So these are animals which are genetically engineered to have more of this resilient protein. And we use exactly the same model Dr. Hen talked about, the learned helplessness model. So you make these mice depressed, and then you ask the question, how quickly do they recover? The sort of the mice that are not genetically engineered don't recover fast. One week later, they're still depressed. The mice that are genetically engineered to have more of this resi resilience protein, by day three, they're almost back to normal. We've done a similar study here where we've reduced the resilience proteins by about 50%, and what you see is that the, not, the, genetic, the mice which are not genetically engineered, you make about 50% of them depressed. So 50% are depressed, 50% are not depressed. When you reduce this BCL2 protein, 100% of these mice become depressed, and they don't respond to antidepressants. So again, suggesting there's something about these resilience proteins that we can target. And that, I think, is going to be one of the areas of the future. So one of the things is going to be to try and get in early, because ideally you want to prevent the heart attack, not come in after it. It's the same thing with many of our illnesses. Our treatments are going to get better, et cetera. But if you can intervene early before you know, it's taken a lot of its toll, that'll be better. And there's a lot of work on, can we make people more resilient? You know, rather than trying to block something, can we boost things that theoretically many people have that are these resilient factors, and will it prevent them from having these multiple relapses? I think that's an exciting area of science. And so that, I think, is just a you know, sort of a message that I think there's a lot of exciting science going on. Unfortunately, we've got a ways to go. But one of the things many of us have thought, and this includes the White House and Congress and NIH, et cetera, is that just like we had the moonshot, you know, 50 years ago, John F. Kennedy sort of challenged the American public, we want to put a man on the moon and bring him back and it sort of brought people together in this unified mission. We want to have the moonshot for the brain. For the next 10 years, can we work together to really understand the fundamental workings of the brain, what happens in disease, what doesn't happen, you know, what goes wrong, et cetera. And if we can do some of that, everyone will benefit. You know, the university pro professors will benefit, the drug companies will benefit, most importantly, humanity will benefit. So that's something that's just started recently, something called the One Mind Campaign. Already, in some areas of science, it's working. This is a, something in Alzheimer's disease called the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. One of the big questions in Alzheimer's disease is, can you predict who's going to get it? Because there's a lot of work going on to try and come up with treatments to slow it down or prevent it. But once again, they'll work better if you come in early. And so this was a in study that brought together the NIH and something like 10 drug companies, all put money together, all studied people, who had some memory problems, but not Alzheimer's, to see, okay, who gets Alzheimer's, who doesn't get Alzheimer's, what predicts? Is it their DNA? Is it this brain imaging, et cetera? So these sorts of partnerships, if we do them right, can really have a lot of benefit. So what we're hoping with this is come up with a way that, you know, whether you're at Merck or J&J or Cold Spring Harbor or NIH, there are some problems we all need to understand together. We need to understand the biology of depression, all of us. 
if we can do that together, then Merck can try and develop its drug, then Dr. Hen can develop his deep brain stimulus, you know, but can we do a lot of this together? Can we also share data? Because, you know, I think it's astounding in the information technology age we live in today, biomedical science is sort of late to the table. And, you know, that's sort of depicted on the left. This is where we are today, where it's, you know, the sort of a parable of the blind men feeling the elephant, and each of them sort of thinks they see something different. And that's how science is done. And unfortunately, we're getting more and more specialized because it's so complex and more and more apart. What we want to try and do things is bring things together. So we wouldn't tell Cold Spring Harbor what to study, but what they study, say it's in related to a schizophrenia model, can some of the data go into a data bank, which also has some clinical data, brain imaging data, so people can try and put the pieces together. So the hope is that you know, if we can do this together, and it's, you know, it's, it's about three weeks old, <laughs> so you know, we don't know how big or you know, effective it's going to be, that it'll be a way for us to you know, really try and tackle these brain diseases together because there's nothing more complicated, there's nothing more devastating. We think the time is right, you know, we can't allow people to suffer anymore, and hopefully we'll be able to marshal our resources together. I'll stop here, and I guess Dr. Hen and I will take questions together. Thank you very much. Thank you.